One of the experiences I trust every homebrewer shares is the feeling of awe that comes from witnessing the conversion of wort into beer through the fermentation process. Even after 15 years, I still get giddy when I see the first signs of airlock activity, a nice fluffy croissant developing on top of my beer. The worst is when this takes too long. You all know the anxiety that comes from checking on a batch a day after pitching and seeing no action. This is why we love Imperial Yeast, who pack 200 billion cells of the purest yeast into each pitch right pouch, which assures quick starts, healthy fermentation, and predictably great results. I strongly urge all of our listeners to check out everything Imperial Yeast has to offer and let them know that you appreciate their support of the Brewlosophy podcast while you're at it. All right, on to the show. When making a batch of beer, there are various proverbial levers a brewer has to adjust the character and quality of the finished product, one being the temperature at which the mash occurs. Now, depending on the style, as well as the desired outcome, a brewer can choose to mash on the cooler end or the warmer end with expectations of a very specific result. You're listening to the Brewlosophy Podcast. I'm your host, Marshall Schott. And in this episode, Andy Carter and I are going to revisit the topic of mash temperature, but focus a little bit more on how it relates specifically to English porter. So mashing, along with fermentation, it's one of these things that are incredibly complicated biochemically you know material handling all that stuff but you can still reduce it down to some simple steps Mm -hmm. and get great results when you dig a little deeper past that surface of mash high mash low you learn a lot of cool things i i wouldn't say you're gonna totally change how you brew but it makes you think a little bit harder and i think just that little bit of extra thought into it will really reap good rewards in your brewing. Yeah. Back when uh, we first started doing our experiments and uh, going public with them uh, with Brewlosophy, the the term that got thrown around a bunch uh, in the beginning, I don't hear it so much anymore, but was dogma, like brewing dogma. Mm-hmm. And we were questioning that or we were, we were testing it out at the very least. And one of the areas, one of the, I guess, uh, variables that... I associate most with that was mash temperature. I mean, there's a lot of dogma wrapped up in mash temperature. Um, I would say that, you know, of all of the experiments that we've done, the ones where we compare beers mashed at different temperatures are some of the most interesting to me, in part because I, you know, was so dogmatic about it Mm -hmm, (laughs) in the beginning. mm -hmm, I think a lot mm -hmm. of us are. Uh, And as a lover of good English porter, I look forward to chatting with you about this topic, Andy. All right. If you like what we're up to and want to keep us doing it, consider becoming a patron of Brewlosophy by committing to a small monthly pledge over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. You'll receive rewards like access to unpublished contributor recipes, unique discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com, and an invite to a monthly live Q&A session with somebody in the brewing world. Our guest for this month is the great Martin Brungard, creator of the Brew and Water Spreadsheet and all-around brewing expert. Make sure to make your pledge at patreon.com slash brewlosophy by October 23rd, 2020 to be a part of this event. All past sessions are stored on our private Facebook page so patrons can go back and watch them whenever they like. Learn more about becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash Slash Brewlosophy. Another really easy way to support us is by simply using the links found at brewlosophy.com slash support. When you're doing your online shopping, your experience doesn't change at all. And we get a little kickback that helps us to keep bringing you this show. And if you wouldn't mind letting us know what you think about this show by leaving a rating and review an Apple podcast or wherever it is you're listening to this podcast, uh, we would really appreciate it. It helps people to find us who may not have heard of us yet. Feedback is brought to you by Brewers Hardware, who specialize in tri-clover compatible sanitary fittings, conical fermenters, kettles and brew stands brewers hardware offers a variety of unique items for home and craft brewers including high quality stainless fittings at great prices with super fast shipping learn more at brewershardware.com and don't forget to mention brewlosophy at checkout to receive a free gift that's brewershardware.com now listener bruce greenberg from los angeles california after listening to the recent brews views episode on brewing with adjuncts wrote in with some tips on using coconut and chocolate and brewing now I've gotten so much feedback on this episode that uh, you're going to be hearing a lot about it in future episodes. I'll tell you that. It struck a chord, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, Here's what Bruce had to say. A few years ago, we spent a week on vacation in Hawaii. My house beer in the condo was Coconut Hiwa Porter by Maui Brewing. While it was certainly good, I wondered if I could do better. So when I got home, I started experimenting with my own coconut porter recipe. I really wanted the coconut flavor to come through and yet not overpower the beer. With Maui Brewing's Coconut Hiwa Porter, I found uh, with some cans that the coconut flavor was almost imperceptible. Hmm. Uh, After multiple batches and perfecting my recipe, here's what I've learned. I use Trader Joe's unsweetened coconut 
coconut chips and toast them in the oven at 300 degrees, stirring every five minutes until golden brown. I then put them in a sanitized bag and place them in the fermenter for 10 to 14 days. I use two pounds of coconut per five and a half gallon batch and include four ounces of lactose in the boil. I find uh, that little bit of sweetness highlights the coconut flavor. Now, Andy, I'm curious what your thoughts are on this, but Bruce does go on to share some tips about chocolate as well. We'll get to that in a sec. Uh, This coconut, the way that he's talking about uh, using coconut actually sounds really appealing to me. That toasted coconut without all the sugar on it. Oh, man, I I would drink that beer all day, it sounds like. Yeah, it's interesting that he's doing it in the fermenter. I I think this is a perfectly fine place to do it. It, I think it gets more contact time. I guess the one, so for me, or if I was approaching coconut, I tend to do it Uh, post-fermentation. It sounded like, you know, 10 to 14 days does sound sound like it's sometime overlapping fermentation and quote-unquote secondary conditioning. Um, I mean, as long as you're, if you're, this is a beer you're making often, then you know how much coconut you want in it and how much right. coconut flavor you're going to get at the end. So for me, I'm a little more uh, spacey with my brewing. I'll do stuff kind of at a random intervals. So I tend to just do it post, you know, it's the beer's done. I like the the, the beer and I then I can control the flavor by tasting it along the way. So yeah. it, it's a perfectly fine place, but definitely toasting. Toasting ingredients brings out new oils, That's brings right. out new flavors, malleard reactions. We're going to talk about that today. You know, those are critical things for flavor and that's what's, I mean, it's exactly what you want to do. Yeah, it's the same. I, I know Mal, in a past episode, Malcolm had mentioned when you're using spices or even when you're it, not even just in brewing, but cooking in general, that you want to mm-hmm. toss those in a like a frying pan and toast them up exactly. just, just for yeah. a few minutes to open up those, uh, I guess, those characteristics in them that that are so desirable. Exactly. Um, so so I, I'm honestly, this coconut thing has got me. You're, we're moving into autumn, which to me is like mm. a porter season. Coconut porter sounds so good. I'm, I'm probably going to go to Trader Joe's and buy some of this coconut today and take Bruce's advice. He's also got some advice uh, for brewing with chocolate that I think is really interesting. He said, a friend introduced me to Oscar Blue's Death by Coconut, which, by the way, I've had, and it is amazing. So um, good. It has a rich, desserty flavor with a light, approachable mouthfeel. I set out to clone this beer, did a fair bit of reading about brewing with chocolate, and then some experimentation with various quantities of cacao nibs. I was repeatedly disappointed by the lack of chocolate flavor coming through. I emailed the head brewer at Oscar Blues and he responded, letting me know about the liquid chocolate product known as Chalaka. It has since become a very standard ingredient for craft brewers who want to make consistent chocolate beers. I haven't found any homebrew stores that carry Chalaka and it's kind of expensive via mail yeah. order. Uh, but when I started making my own chocolate syrup, combining four ounces of organic cocoa powder from Costco, he says, and some bourbon. After letting it sit overnight for the bourbon to sanitize the cocoa powder, I add it to the Mm -hmm. fermenter. Just as with the coconut, I include four ounces of lactose in the boil because I find a bit of sweetness really brings out the chocolate flavor without adding any cloying sweetness. This idea of making a chocolate syrup with bourbon and cocoa powder, dude, Bruce is onto something here. That sounds so good. This This is some really good stuff, and I think he's doing it the right way, which is simple. Obviously, he always talks about sanitization, which is critical in these adjuncts. We talked about a little bit in the negative sides of having uh, unsanitary practices in the podcast, right? <laughs> uh, but uh, but you know the the simplicity of this is great. Um, I, I like that he's subbing in because I looked at that that liquid coke uh, cacao stuff. It is expensive and oh, yeah. hard to get, right? So it's not practical. It's really not practical for the home brewer. But I like this, like make that tincture and then you add a little bit. Is do you want more chocolate flavor? Um, add up, add more of it, see what you get. So yeah. perfect stuff, great stuff. Yeah, I, I, I'm so we. I've had uh, chalaca on its own. Uh, they, I was at a conference and they were just serving little cups of it, just to, so you can get an idea of what it tastes like. It's kind of gritty. I mean, it's you can tell yeah. that it is a genuine chocolate product. It's not some weird, you know, syrup that, that's all yeah. sweet and all that. Um, but we have an experiment, and perhaps we'll we'll talk about it on a future episode where we compared, I believe, cacao nibs with chalaca. So mm-hmm. uh, there's some data out there on those. Either way, the idea of uh, making a syrup syrup out of bourbon and cocoa powder. Man, you got me hooked, Bruce. Thank you for the feedback. If you have show feedback, you can send it to feedback at brewlosophy.com or drop us a note on social media. Due in part to the COVID quarantine, as well as Jersey's very busy work schedule, we are all out of beer reviews. I've got a fridge full of listener submitted beers, but no Jersey and Tim to review them. We do have plans. Uh, we've are, The state of California is kind of loosening things up. We're having a drop in uh, or reduced infections on COVID, and I've got a nice big space in here where we can stay six feet apart. So it is planned, but Jersey is currently out of town. 
Well, while going through some old stuff on my computer, I came upon a folder from August of 2016, four years ago. That's right around the time Jersey and Tim got their start. Uh, And in this folder, there was a bunch of audio files, reviews the boys and I did at a local event called the Clovis Craft Beer Crawl, which I believe had to be canceled this year because of COVID. My brother-in-law, Uncle Joe, who's been on the show before, was with us. uh, And the first beer we sampled was a commercial New England IPA called Juice by Full Circle Brewing Company. One minute beer review with Jersey and Tim. There's a thing we do called a bromosa where you pour, you take like a Corona and you pour an orange juice in it. And that's kind of what this this tastes like that. You know that feeling when you brush your teeth and then you drink orange juice? (laughs) That's kind of what this tastes like. (laughs) It's a bromosa. I was thinking about cleaning my toilet with it. So Tim and Joe don't really like New England style IPAs. (laughs) I'm going to give my, I'm I'm the only judge here, okay? So I'm going to give me your beer, give me your beer. It tastes like leather and feelings and (laughs) offshore drilling. No, it's it's a good example of the style, I think. I'm not an IPA guy, but... I, I don't mind this, and it's not hanging around in my mouth, which I don't like. Yeah. I don't. I love it. And, you know, this is a good Nipa. Uh, right. Instant credibility. This is the best orange juice soup I've had today. Uh, it looks like OJ to me. I think for the style, it is very good. <laughs> you conformist. <laughs> it's good. I've, I've had enough of these now that I can tell you that I would drink this. The guy <laughs> from Full Circle has a gun to my head right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's been so weird going back and listening to those old yeah. reviews. To me, it really shows how the guys have kind of grown up in their tasting abilities. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it was still good to hear them. They they did. They were definitely very descriptive. I mean, they, they, we knew the bones were there back in 2016 that these guys could <laughs> taste beer and do, give, give, give a critical evaluation. Yeah, yeah. I mean... It, Honestly, um, that we had had a few beers before we showed up. We had our Uber drop us off down there. And, sure. Um, and it was a great event. I, we got we got invited out there by uh, a local, the the Clovis Chamber of Commerce and all that mm-hmm. wanted us there to, to kind of bump it up. But it was a great time. Now, the, the head brewer of Full, Full Circle back then was Mike Sumaya, who is long gone from, from Full Circle. Uh, he's actually now uh, running his own thing called Inc- Incinerati Brewing. Um, but he is a huge lover of New England IPA, of the hazy IPA thing. And I believe he's the one who came up not only with the juice recipe but he was he played a big role in kind of turning full circle around and then of course brad Gaines came in and now brad's doing his own thing with crow and wolf so uh the beer was very good it has been very good mike is a wonderful brewer um and so the fact that you know jersey enjoyed it i think says a lot i didn't expect yep. him to, to like it too much but he seemed to be okay <laughs> with it so all right if you'd like to have your beer or any other fermented beverage you feel like sending in uh reviewed by jersey and tim you can email me marshall at brewlosophy.com and we'll get you all set up we'll be back to talk about mash temperature as it relates to english porter after this break Brewlosophy is headquartered out of Fresno, California, a quaint city in the shadow of the Sierra Nevada mountain range, which has been ravaged by wildfires this season. Closest to home is the Creek Fire. In fact, I was camping with my family when it started and we all had to be evacuated. This fire has grown to become the largest wildfire in California's history and most of the structures destroyed were primary residences. Rebuild Our Sierra is a grassroots, long-term fundraising effort created by a few dedicated mountain people with the goal of helping those who have been affected by this wildfire. They know that when the smoke clears and the relief organizations move on, the mountains and foothills will need help to rebuild, revive, and renew. Find out more by following Rebuild Our Sierra on Facebook and Instagram, and be sure to visit rebuildoursierra.org. After a long brew day, the last thing I want to do is waste more time chilling wort. I've tried so many different options, and ultimately I settled on the super efficient immersion chillers made by Jaded Brewing. With the King Cobra and Hydra, I'm able to chill my entire batch of wort from boiling to just a few degrees above groundwater temperature in as little as six minutes. If an immersion chiller is right for your brewery, then do yourself a favor and check out all of the rad options Jaded Brewing has to offer at jadedbrewing.com. And be sure to let them know Brewlosophy sent you. Compact and simple to use with a small footprint for brewing indoors, the Grainfather makes it easy for you to brew professional quality beers at home. The Grainfather is an all-in-one brewing system that lets you brew all-grain beer in a single, compact stainless steel unit. It uses an electric heating element and pump to maintain a constant temperature and to circulate the wort during the mashing and cooling stages. It also comes with a counterflow chiller to reduce chilling times and produce high-quality wort. 
And now, with the addition of their conical fermenter, the Grain Father takes things one step further by offering homebrewers state-of-the-art temperature-controlled fermentation just like commercial breweries use. And with the Grain Father Recipe Creator and Connect app, you can easily design a recipe, sync your brewing system with your phone, and then just sit back and relax as the app takes over and assures that you maintain your scheduled mash temps and boil schedule. Head to GrainFather.com to purchase your all-in-one brewing system today and to sign up for their free recipe creator tool. Once more, head on over to GrainFather.com, that's GrainFather.com, and get started today. Family-owned Atlantic Brew Supplies, the largest homebrew shop in the Southeast. No gimmicks, no multinational corporate overlords, and no BS. They offer exclusive malts, yeast, and more from local artisans, as well as award-winning recipe kits. They also sell professional brewing gear and cask equipment from sister companies ABS Commercial and Cask Supply. Most ingredients are available by the ounce, plus Atlantic Brew Supply has an on-site calculator to help you craft your best brew. Orders are processed same day, and two-day shipping is guaranteed for East Coast customers. Get 15% off your first order using promo code code BrewPod. That's B-R-U-P-O-D at AtlanticBrewSupply.com. When I was brewing extract, mash temperature was something I didn't focus on at all because I wasn't mashing, just steeping specialty grains for flavor and color. Once I made the switch to all grain, mash temperature suddenly became a major focus uh, as I learned it played a huge role in the character of a finished beer. Yeah, I started with extract and you had colors and flavors and things like that. And then you know, there is a definitely a point. And I, and I wonder now, you know, what we're, you know, we're many years later. I think homebrewing has obviously evolved and it's no longer the case, in my opinion, that you're going to start with extract. I think you're, you're more likely to go all grain, but at least when we were going, we were starting homebrewing, going to all grain meant something. You were going to really commit to the process. That's right. right. Gonna, you, you were going to be a brewer. <laughs> you were going to yeah. be a brewer. Right. And there was that always a little bit of a stigma. I think, a, I think an incorrect stigma that ma- that malt extract beers are going to have a certain flavor, different topic, different podcast, but, um, you <laughs> that's know, that's a bruise views, man. <laughs> that's a bruise views. Uh, they, uh, the, 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 the mashing process, like I said, uh, uh up front, you know, it's incredibly complicated chemically, but it can be boiled down to just a few statements, you know, pick a temperature, pick a time, make sure your grain bill has enough of the right components and go for it. Yeah. And so, What's critical here is, or it's what we're going to talk about today, is what does the temperature, or how does temperature affect the mashing process uh, holistically? Before we really get into that, there, when I think about uh, brewing in general, and, I, and I, I say this all the time, I'm sort of beating a dead horse, but the fact that we know so much about this process and and uh, the that we're able to even make this delicious product and it just blows my mind anyways. Mm-hmm. But like you, you think about, In the beginning, how long it must have taken brewers to realize, hey, you know what? When we do this weird thing where we steep this weird malted barley in uh, water, if it's at this temperature, it seems to turn out better or it does this thing. You know, at the time, they didn't have a full understanding of enzymatic reactions and all of that. They were just trying to make beer consistently, right? Sure, sure. So just thinking about that is such a it's such an odd thing for me that we've come so far in our understanding of how this thing works. Well, it's it's funny, and I and me being an electrical engineer specifically in semiconductors you know if you think about how i do my job and it's you know building blocks and things like that but the, the basic stuff was observations were made for thousands of years and then they were codified into math and so you you have a lot of experience but then it becomes scientific because of research and development so right. you have mashing and i was looking back and trying to get a timeline in my head for this podcast but you know you know what malt malting or the malting process it's thousands of years old yeah they did not have microscopes and you know sophisticated measurement of gear back in Egypt, right? They just had a process. They knew if they did A, B, and C, beer came, whatever they called it, but something proto beer was made. Yeah. So they just kept doing it the same way and got those same results. It was only with time that and maybe you know adding some complexity did we actually understand it better. Right. And that's what you see today in modern brewing. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating to me. Yeah. So let's talk specifically about mash temperature. We do there are some things that we know one hundred percent for sure happen because of modern science. Um it, and and I th- 
it's it's tough to to really nail down specific ranges when it comes to temperature because sure. even though numbers are are certain and safe, there is some I guess contradictory stuff you'll find on the web about what is the lowest temperature you can mash sure. at, what's the warmest. But then somebody goes and says, "Well, I made a decent beer and I screwed this up, you know, and I was way down at 125F or whatever, and it worked fine." Mm-hmm. So there mm-hmm. there are you know we can get into step mashes. We're not going to do that here, but there are different things. Let's talk about your general single infusion mash what is the standard range and what happens at the, why why might we you know uh, mash at these different temperatures and what's happening at those different temperatures yeah so you know i think most people on this listening to this or their first introduction to mashing is the single infusion which is you're going to pick a temperature to hold your mash at which is your mash consists of its barley grains maybe some specialty malt so on and so forth what's going on is when you have malt barley malt it's been steeped dried, germinated, and that's creating enzymes on the on the malt itself. And there's two primary enzymes going on here, beta amylase and alpha amylase. They enzymes are, you know, th- pieces of proteins that are folded up in a certain way. And what they do is lower the activation energy or the ability for these starches that are on the grain, the amylose starches to turn into maltose or maltriose. And they like different temperatures, and this is kind of like how well they work. But as we mentioned, you know, these ranges, you know, they're not set in stone. They're analog. They're not digital. These enzymes work over wide temperature ranges, and they work more or less effectively depending on the temperature. Right. Beta amylase likes it cooler, usually around 131 to 149 Fahrenheit or 55 to 65 Celsius. Above a certain temperature, around 160, again, a soft number, uh-huh. it stops working or denatures. What happens is the protein is kind of bound together with little chemical bonds, but as soon as it gets too hot, it kind of fl- fl- flops apart and kind of falls apart and then stops being an enzyme. It goes just flaccid, de- basically. It goes, yes, <laughs> yes. And it goes away. And that's and then it stops working. That's critical, right? So they have a, a maximum temperature before they basically... Com- spontaneously combust, and I and I like the way uh, y- you make very clear that these are soft numbers. Um, I I read something a while ago uh, when I was just studying, you know, back when I was geeking out on all this stuff, uh, j- just to learn more. That th- a good way to view beta and alpha amylase enzymes is that they they it's like a a, a race car that takes its your your you take your foot off the gas pedal, but you're still moving and you still mm-hmm. you slow down you you know gradually you'll slow down, but it's not like you automatically stop as soon as your, exactly. your foot's off the gas. And that's the way you can think about these amylase enzymes as well, is that y- you can get above, you can get up to that 160F or that 71C, and beta amylase is still going to do its thing, but it's rapidly denaturing and slowing down. Um, exactly. but, but to put it very simply, when, you, when we think about beta amylase, that is associated with lower mash temperatures, which for, I think, you know, 99% of brewers means right around like between 149 F, uh, you know, and maybe 152 degrees Fahrenheit, sure, which is sure. like, I don't know, 65 to 66, 67 C, something like that. And, and when we do that, those beta amylase enzymes chop starches into shorter chain sugars that are very easily consumed by yeast. Right. And so yep. that is going to result in a more fermentable wort and then, that means that you're going to have a little bit more alcohol in the beer as opposed to a, a beer that you mash warmer, which activates uh, the alpha amylase enzyme. Yeah. So alpha amylase is another, again, enzyme working more at the higher end. It likes to be, again, likes to be, not has to be between 145, 158 Fahrenheit or 63 to 70 C or a warmer mash. What this is doing is it's chopping up those sugars, these amyloses, but into longer longer chain sugars, more like maltriose. Beta amylase is really worried about maltose. You know, the, These names come from the fact that barley malt is usually just called malt, and maltose is the sugar that's really in inside of these mm-hmm. grains. So what's going on there is these longer chain sugars, less fermentable because yeast... Some yeasts can't even ferment maltriose, or they ferment it more poorly. They really want maltose. So that lowers the fermentability of the total wort and then raises your finishing gravity so there's going to be less alcohol right. at the end of the day. Right. And maltotriose is an interesting one because you'll hear often that uh, traditional lager strains, and this is a different subject uh, on its own, but that traditional lager strains, so Pistorianist yeast, mm-hmm. uh, actually have... A, the genetic ability to uh, metabolize maltotriose um, more than, say, your 
standard ale yeast strains, which I think is really interesting. It's one of the reasons yeah. I've heard given as to why, you know, uh, your your classic lagers tend to be dry and, sure. you know, pleasantly dry, like in a good way. So, but it's interesting. And and like you said, you mash warm, You those those enzymes are going to convert those starches into longer chain sugars that are not as easily metabolized in general. Um, and this is just dumbing it down for people like me, uh, which is going to result in a less fermentable wort and thus less, uh, less alcohol in the finished beer. Those are the basics. We've talked about mash temperature a lot. Now, Obviously, taking what we know and is very easily measured about mash temperature, anybody who's ever mashed too high or too low has seen the results. Uh, You are going to get a different FG, right? Mm -hmm. There are some beliefs that brewers and those who know about brewing have just come to almost ubiquitously accept in regards to mash temperature and the way that they work. And I, I think the most obvious one is that if you mash too warm, quote unquote, too warm, uh, let's say you're making a Pilsner and you accidentally mash it at 158 instead of you know 150, the idea is that that's going to produce a sweeter beer than if you had mashed eight degrees Fahrenheit lower, right? Yeah, that's the common kind of book textbook answers or you know web answers for this and i think that it's it's better to say that your beer will be less fermentable and then you need to taste it kind of how we do run these experiments to see the answers rather than assume up front because sweetness or the perception of sweetness is not dictated necessarily by the length of the sugar our mouths are not highly sensitive calibrated instruments they respond in a myriad of ways to taste and flavor. And so it's really hard to just draw a one-to-one correlation about sweetness and lengths of sugars and such. So I think you're being very equivocal right now, Andy. And I say that because it is so widely accepted that higher FG is just means a sweeter beer. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and, and on many levels it does. If you add a bunch of lactose to beer, you're going to have an, a higher FG and a perceptibly sure. sweeter product. But, but I, I can't think of a time prior to us experimenting with this where I heard somebody question this idea that, mm-hmm. that you know, a higher uh, mash temperatures and thus higher FG results in a sweeter beer. That was just commonly accepted to the point where when I was going through the BJCP judging process and getting my, you know, getting all credentialed there, that mm-hmm. was like something you studied. If if yeah. somebody submits a beer to a competition and it tastes too sweet, what are the issues that you might you know point out? Well, did they use too much crystal malt? The next thing on the list was, yeah. did they mash too warm? You know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's more complicated, but I think in general, you know, if you're mashing higher, you know, that that is going to lower your ABV and you should have a fuller beer versus lower mash temperature, lower finishing gravity, higher ABV, uh, thinner, drier. And, you know, it's it's interesting. It's it, I think I think there, we have we have to draw a distinction between the, these quantitative measurements that we have, which is we can definitely measure the alcohol. We can definitely measure the, these gravity points yeah. and less about the qualitative percept percept perceptibility of the beer once it's finished in these two points. So, yeah, yeah, it's more complicated. It is. I, but I think that with. You know, I, I, this is kind of, I guess, uh, self-validating here, but I think through experimentation, which is what we're all about, the more we do this, the more clear our perspective or our understanding of what ma- how mash temperature actually affects beer. I mean, I'll yeah. be honest. We've done multiple mash temperature experiments. We've discussed some in past episodes. Uh, we're going to our focus is going to shift to one in, in, in particular that we haven't discussed yet in this episode. But the results of those uh, past experiments weren't necessarily uh, well, they, we'll just call them surprising. They weren't re- yeah. they weren't significant. People weren't as able to uh, uh, distinguish a beer mashed cool as it was warm. And that led me to kind of shifting my perspective. And I, you know, I brewed one of those one of those mm-hmm. experiments, shifting my perspective into viewing mash temperature as something perhaps you use the that lever is more in terms of ABV. Well, what how do I want this beer how boozy do I want this beer to be? If it's going to mm-hmm. taste the same, you know, p- presumably if it's going to taste the same, 
I can use, still use mash temperature. We know very objectively it's going to impact ABV. So all else equal, I can use this as a way to adjust the finished alcohol level in the beer. And I think that's on its own is pretty cool. However, it's still widely accepted that mash temperature, understandably, does have a perceptible impact on beer as well. Let's shift our focus a little bit to talking about English porter and how mash temperature relates to this style, uh, style in particular. I mean, I view English porter as being first off, a delicious style. I love it. Mm-hmm. Um, but as having certain qualities to it that that I feel people would use mash temperature to adjust. Yeah. So just we're going to take the BJCP style guideline definition of English porter, a moderate strength brown beer with a restrained roasty character and bitterness. May have a range of roasted flavors, generally without burnt qualities and often has a chocolate caramel multi profile. Right up front, moderate strength brown beer. Yep. So we already know just talking about ABV, or to pick a mash temperature that's going to give a mash temperature and recipe that's going to give us a moderate strength. So you have a choice. You can start with a high, higher OG mash higher, get yourself less alcohol. So you have that moderate strength, or you're going to have a lower OG mash lower. Right. So you get finishing drier. So if you read this, you're, I would say your first take is I want to be mash higher to maybe leave some of these sweeter characters in this moderate strength beer. That would be, I mean, that is exactly what I've done in the past when making not just English porter, but any kind of porter. Um, You know, BJCP gives a range of 1040 OG to 1052 OG as the starting, you know, gravity for this style. But then the FG range is 1008 to 1014. When you put that together, there's a lot of in between there that, you you know, you're going to hit it. If you you get an OG of 1048, you're probably going to land somewhere between 1008 and 1014, regardless of where you mash. Sure. Um, but, but you know, when I think about that chocolatey, they say chocolate caramel malty profile, the first thing my mind goes to after the grains that I choose to use, of course, is, ma- is mash temperature. That's just mm-hmm. what I've been trained to do. And to get that along with what I perceive in a good porter as a kind of a creamy mouthfeel with a nice mm. smooth body, uh, probably upwards of, of uh, low to medium to medium bodied you know, beer, I'm, I'm thinking, all right, I'll, this, the perfect mash temperature for an English porter in my book is 153, 154 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, mm. which is right. I believe that's right around 65 C. Yeah, exactly. So it's funny, you know, we're as we like you mentioned learning about how to home brew and everything you read these things and you immediately look at these numbers and then you immediately start dictating not only your your process but you think that those processes are going to lead to certain results. Yeah. I would not expect someone to think if they didn't see the OGFG numbers they publish, you know, oh, well, I'm going to start at 1080. Right. I'm going to make a I mean, you're not going to do that, right? You're just going to make a certain recipe, but we're also we we also read between the lines and 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 ascribe the mash temperature to leading to these characters. And I, I think that's a step too far unless you have experience in making certain recipes and seeing what their results are and the real reasons behind certain flavors and their outcomes in the beer. Well, I mean, so if you are the type of person, and I'll be honest, I have a tendency to be this way, who overly relies on guidelines, you know, yeah. in brewing beer, I you can you can make absolutely excellent versions of every style in the BJCP guidelines if you just stick to exactly what they say in there. Yeah. But the reality is, and I've talked to Gordon Strong about this a few times, in fact, the guidelines are really just uh, guidelines. They're not you. Don't, they're not set in stone. If you you could submit a English porter, for example, that's 1056 OG and 1015 FG, and chances are, that, I mean, I, I would bet hundred percent. In fact, that the, the judge isn't going to say, Oh my God, this is out of range for an English Porter. Yeah. It's probably going to taste the same as one that was, you know, that, that was within those ranges, uh, uh, designated by the BJCP. That being said, the mash temperature issue for me, there is, I'm, 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 I'm hearkening back to my, my pre experimental days here. And I'm thinking, man, if, if I was making an English Porter and I mash in and I realize, ah, oh, crap, you know, I'm hitting 146 F, you know, about 63 C and I'm, this beer is going to be ruined. It's going to, it's going to over attenuate. It's going to be too dry. Right. It's, and that's mm-hmm. going to facilitate this ashiness, which is what something that I used to associate with that, that characteristic with overly attenuated roasty beers, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. there are just certain expectations that we have based on mash temperature. Yeah. And I think that that is that I mean, it's important to learn these fundamentals and, like we said, guidelines up front, and then understand where they're 
some of these expectations can fall fall apart a little bit. And I think that you know, with especially with mash temperature, the BJCP guidelines are for the judges to how they perceive the beer when the beer is in front of them and if they match the style or not. And like you said, Marsh, I don't think if you made a beer that has a little higher OG, a little higher FG, would it be very different? Because it's it's really the end result and how you taste it that get you the, re- the answers, not the specific numbers yeah. that you picked. Well, and then there's an element of, and I and I and I feel like um, this really speaks to the importance of blind, um, I guess, testing. There's yeah. an element of bias that goes into. Uh, the way we perceive beer. So, so an example here is if I take, you know, three of my most trusted uh, judging brewing beer friends, uh, and I and I set them all in front of me, and I say, here is a uh, English porter that was mashed at 165 degrees Fahrenheit, way too warm. You know, let me know what you think. There's a good chance they're going to come back with, oh, it's too sweet. You know, yep. because yep. we so we 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 our brains are so influenced by our expectations and our expectations expectations are built on what we've been taught right and and so yeah. there's an aspect of this i you know what i was talking about if i were to accidentally mash too low in an english porter there there's a, a component of uh expectation bias that i know Absolutely. is influencing the way i'm perceiving that beer but i guarantee you back before doing all these experiments I would have thought that an English porter mashed that low would be ashy and and thin and not good, and one mashed too warm would be sweet and cloying and unpalatable. Yeah, and I think uh, we're talk about that rapidly here with our with the mash tap experiment. But yeah, I think uh, these biases. If you're if you're tasting your own beer, like you said, I bet if you look mash too low and then you're gonna go pour pour yourself a pint, you're never gonna enjoy any pint because right. you know how it was made. Yeah. But if you give it to someone else, they're gonna say it's fine. Oh, so that that leads me to another. Uh, I believe we've discussed it in a Brewsby's episode, but the odd way that people uh, perceive and talk about the beer that they brew, since they know everything that went into it, you've got like two classes of people: the ones who are absolutely overly critical about everything they and their friends brew, and then the ones who just think they're the best and everything they make yeah. is amazing. Uh, it, yeah. it cracks me up, but regardless, like, like you know, that's the point: is that there are there's a lot of beliefs surrounding mash temperature. We know this. We, there's objectively observable impacts that it has. We've talked about that. There are the subjective, uh, well, you know, the subjective side of it, and what people believe is going uh, to result from uh, beers mashed at different temperatures. Commonly, uh, in in my practice, if I'm making an English porter, I'm going to mash at 154 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm-hmm. Um, again, that's that's you know, you're right around the 65 degrees celsius mark and to me that's kind of a best of both worlds temperature for that yeah. style where where you're activating both beta and alpha amylase so they're doing their thing but you're not going to get that super dry it, again in my mind you're not going to get that super dry ashy thing and there will be again presumably a uh, uh, remnant long chain sugars that really amplify the body and the uh, maybe a hint of sweetness in the porter which i think goes really well with that style yeah, and I think it's important that th- that kernel of truth there, the that middle of the road temperature, what they some people call the brewer the brewing window, is a balance between the enzymes activation and the li- the solubility of the starches in the grain. Because really, a mash is a process of extracting sugars from barley, and it's it's complicated in the sense that you want to pick everything for the the maximize the sh- to ex- sugar extract. Really, that is a practice of you know getting the best the highest fermentability and everything like that it's also for professional brewing getting the best cost because they want to get the most sugar out of the grains for the dollar they spent yeah Uh, you also want to do it for the sake of the repeatability we want to make sure when we're mashing we're getting the same ogs at fgs that we predict absolutely well as science has shown us mash temperature does have a very observable observable effect on things like attenuation uh, but brewers have also widely accepted it has a perceptible impact on beer we tested it out on an english porter results when we return Have you ever thought about adding a port to your kettle but held off because you didn't feel like drilling into your gear or sending it off to have someone else do it? From the makers of the world's fastest counterflow chiller, the Exchillerator, comes the Hangover. The easiest way to add extra ports to your kettle as well as countless other options. Mount a faucet to your keg for easy portable pouring. Set up the perfect whirlpool arm. Hold a heating element in place. All of this and so much more without permanently modifying your gear. Manufactured right here in the United States, The Hangover offers brewers too many convenient solutions to list here. So head over to Exchillerator.com today to see what The Hangover can do for you. 
As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world, carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic, as well as other ingredients and gear, Yakima Valley Hops has it all. And don't forget to check out their new podcast, The Late Edition, where the YVH crew goes into depth on our favorite plant with industry experts. Head over to YakimaValleyHops.com now to see all they have to offer and subscribe to The Late Edition wherever it is you listen to podcasts. Craftmaster Growlers takes traveling with and sharing beer to a new level. Made from heavy-duty stainless steel, Craftmaster Growlers are double-wall insulated and can keep beer cold for up to eight hours. Unlike typical Growlers, Craftmaster Growlers come with a swiveling tap and fully integrated CO2 regulator cap, allowing beer to stay fresh for two weeks or more. The square design takes up less space and will fit in most refrigerator doors, and every Craftmaster Growler comes with a one-year warranty. There are 64 and 128-ounce versions available over at CraftmasterGrowlers.com. The brew in a bag method has blown up over the last few years, and in that time, it's become very clear that not all bags are created equal. For the best BIAV experience, you have got to go with the brew bag. Made from high-quality food-safe polyester, the brew bag is available in both 210 micron for standard brew in a bag, as well as 400 micron, which works beautifully for all-in-one recirculating systems. I've been a brew bag user for years and wouldn't brew without it. Head over to brewinabag.com to get the fabric filter that works for you and use promo code TBP17 at check out to receive a discount. Again, that's brewinabag.com. I absolutely love English porter and most types of porter for that matter. And while not necessarily chewy or thick, I do expect this style to have some body and perhaps a, a creaminess to the mouthfeel. And one method that I've used in the past to achieve this is by mashing at a more moderate temperature. Andy, you were curious to see just what effect mash temperature has on an English porter and tested it out. Yeah. So I've been reading brewlosophy for many years. And of course, when articles that look at fundamental aspects of brewing come out, I'm always intrigued. And when I wanted to pick a few of these experiments to go back and re-examine, re uh, mash temp came up really first for me. But I want to take a different spin, which was use a beer that had specialty grains, uh, was really the focus of the beer rather than just a base malt. And so for this one, we picked English Porter. I used 77% uh, Maris Otter, 13% uh, Caramel 80, 6% Chocolate Malt, and 4% Brown Malt. I find for these recipes, having a Maris Otter base allows that more complicated base malt to come through, but then you, you can't neglect the specialty ingredients. You know, this is almost 25% specialty malts, and I like to have a well-rounded uh, set of malts, not just dark malts, not just moderately colored uh, caramel malts, because that provides the beer to have a rounded flavor, the chocolate, the cocoa, the coffee, and not just sharp bitterness from the uh, darker malts, and not just plain generic flavor because this is porter it's got to have color it's got to have flavor yeah let me as a small aside here i've used brown malt one time and i felt and this was years and years ago but i felt like it contributed kind of an acrid thing mm. to uh, the now i was making a brown ale what yeah. do you, what do you get from brown malt i changed my mind because i'm <laughs> i want to well, okay, i want to use it again i, I think that's a, that's a great question so first i looked at brown malt because a it was available at my shop and b i've read that porters used brown malt back in the day yeah now the brown malt from back in the day is nothing like we have today and i think that's a whole nother discussion about what malt is you know hundreds or 200 years ago and what, how these styles were started, right. like London Porter versus what we have today. I will say this. I think that brown malt, you know, is a nice kind of biscuity, you know, kind of you, you can chew on it. I do recommend everyone go and tr actually eat these malts so mm -hmm. you can get a sense of what they taste like when you're going to put them in beer and really taste the difference between like C30 and C80. Yeah. Uh, but it's, you know, biscuity, toasty, you know, nice. I think maybe Marshall and I, and I, I, I this is my observation I think that these specialty malts age much more poorly than base malt. And I bet what you're tasting is old brown malt. You're not buying it. No one else is buying it at the shop. And perhaps you had an old bag of it. Huh. That's my take on it. Okay. Okay. I'll give it another shot. I'll buy it I online. Give it a, yeah. Give it, get a, yeah go, go online. Go to more beer. They, I buy a lot of. I buy a ton of stuff at my local shop. But if I need something, I want to make it sure I'm buying it fresh. I try to go to a producer that's turning the, the product over a lot. So. Well, mark my words, I will pick some up. I, I promised I was going to buy some golden naked oats. Now I have five pounds out in my garage. So I, I, I stick to my promises here. Let's get back to the experiment. Uh, this is actually where the variable came into play was uh, at the mashing point. So tell us about mm -hmm. that. So what I did here was 
I wanted to look at the two ends of the ranges we talked about earlier. So what we're, you know, fundamentally alpha amylase, beta amylase. So, and we wanted a wide range. We've done temperature experiments that have been at shorter ranges. And, and this was kind of the largest breath. Now we don't want to be so low as to not mash at all because the enzymes do need some temperature to go to activate. So we picked one, I picked one end with 147 Fahrenheit or 64 Celsius. So this would be focusing on the beta amylase uh, enzyme. And then the other end it, the really high end where we're starting to approach the end of the activation of alpha amylase or 163 Fahrenheit or 73 Celsius. What's go, we know when we set that up, we're definitely going to have a difference in fermentability of the wort. So one, the higher mash temp wort is going to be less fermentable than the lower mash temp wort. That's just that, 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 that we would absolutely expect to happen. Uh, otherwise, we've done something wrong because we know this from p past experience and in, in the science of mashing that these are the two these two things should happen. We don't, and I, like I said, I don't want to be too hot or too cold. So these are moderate ranges. We have beta amylase that's going to create maltose or very fermentable, very short chain sugars, and then one. And, but at 163, that doesn't mean that there is no beta amylase activity because the there it has a lifetime. Like I said, these are not binary ranges; these are you know, kind of softer, more analog ranges. What is going to happen though, is at 163, that beta amylase is going to turn off much more quickly. It's going to kind of ramp down much faster, leaving mostly alpha amylase to do all the, the, the sugar, uh, the, the sugar modifications. So these balance, these choices, you know, we could have even done a wider range. I just think that we picked the range I picked was there so that we would get the best bang for our buck, uh, it w with the results, with the result and resulting beers. Again, these enzymes are coming from the base malt, 77% of the malt being Maris Otter, which is going to carry all these enzymes. And that was another consideration too, is that you don't want to have too little base malt. Otherwise the conversion won't happen either. So, yeah, but I would say that this Delta 147 to 163 F or 64 to 73, I mean, that's, that's a big Delta. That's a big yeah. difference. If we're going to see a difference after all of the mash temperature experiments we've already done, uh, might as well go, you know, like you said, uh, go big or go home type of thing. Yeah. Best bang for the buck. So now, now in, in thinking about what we might expect from both of these beers, we already discussed it in the last segment, but real quick, that, that beer mashed at 147 Fahrenheit, 64 C, I would expect, right, uh, to be thinner, to have more alcohol, maybe even have a, a, a slightly warmer uh, mouthfeel yep. to it because of the increased booze in the beer. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and again, just a, I don't know why I have this idea, but perhaps be a little more accurate, have more of an ashy thing that you get from that chocolate malt and that brown malt mm -hmm. because of how dry it is. It doesn't have mm -hmm. the sweetness to bolster or to, to kind of buttress uh, those roasty characters characters sure the 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 beer mashed at 163f or 73 i would expect to be overly sweet i would expect mm. for it to be maybe chewy and kind of syrupy because again i know through science we know that that one's going to finish at a higher fg despite starting at the same og and so I, yep. again if it's if that's the case naturally then <laughs> i say that you know half jokingly, uh, mm -hmm. then that means there's more sugars in the beer and thus it's going to be sweeter, thicker, more chewy, all of that. So those are the expectations I think a lot of us would have uh, about this experiment. Um, you you did proceed to, to make this beer, you know, the regular way that you would, I believe you yep. boiled for 60 minutes, right? Yep. 60 minutes. So standard, you know, these, these are things I don't like to change too often unless we have a good reason, like an experiment. So 60 minutes, 28 grams of Will Willamette hops at 60 minutes uh, with 15 grams of Willamette at 30 minutes. So just standard issue. We're not going for a big hoppy beer here. So, you know, just base, base notes of, uh, uh the floral hops, um, after boiling, chilling it down, we'd grab some refractometer readings. And this was a thing, the first interesting thing. So the lower mash temp had a 1.053 original gravity, while the higher mash temp had a 1.055 OG gravity. I think this was interesting. I mean, it was measurably different. Um, you know, we try to brew identically as, as possible here, but we did change a variable. That was the mash temperature. My suspicion with this slight difference in mash temp, and especially the higher OG or higher mash temperature having a higher OG, is that the salt, the, the starches in the grain were much more soluble at the higher temperature, leading us to extract more sugar and there have therefore have a higher OG uh, due to that. It's exactly what we would expect. Yeah, no, it's, it's straight up. If we were doing the same exact thing and just changing mass temperature, now these are two different systems, two different times, you know, right. controlling for all variables. That's what we try to do here. 
that makes perfect sense. But they're close enough together. Now, if 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 I had done this beer and I was at one o five three and one o six, now I would be really worried because now I think we're introducing new variables. The original gravity being a new variable, but we are testing mash temperature. We're going to take take those results for what they are and, and proceed. There you go. So so we put them into PET carboys. I use I tend to use those a lot around here. We used uh, Imperial Yeast A01, or the house strain. I made a small starter, a little Vitality starter between two packs, um, and then I split that yeast between both fermenters equally and allowed them to ferment at uh, 66 Fahrenheit or 19 Celsius. I, you know, As one does in home brewing, you check on your beer uh, insistently. And with the PET carboys, it's easy to see when beers are started. So about 24 hours later, I went to the fermentation chamber and looked, and it looked like the lower temp beer had much more activity at 24 hours than the high temp beer. This was interesting. Now, it's hard to say that it was specifically the sugars being eaten because I didn't take an, a, a gravity reading at that pace. I, this was just visual. My suspicion, though, is that the lower temperature mash beer being more fermentable allowed the yeast to get started a little faster. Um, they grew a little bit more and they had more Krausen. And I, and I think this is this makes sense. Yeah. It's yeah. more fermentable. So. Yeah. So that's actually something that I believe has been fairly consistently observed in our mash temperature experiments is that the the the, the wort that is effectively more fermentable because it was mashed cooler uh, does seem to kick up fermentation activity a little bit quicker and uh, something that I, I I gotta actually look back but I believe one of the weird things that I noticed about my high mash temperature beers is that during the boil they seem to have a little bit more foam like it like 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 hot break during the boil and then also uh, the the uh, Croissant just had a different appearance to it it wasn't crazy or drastically different sure. but um, if I recall correctly uh, the, the first time I did a mash temperature experiment um, the the, uh, the the low mash temp beer uh, like I had like a blow off because <laughs> it was so yeah, yeah, active, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was yeah, the yeah, fermentation yeah. was just so active, and that and it sort of makes sense. Again, there's more stuff in there for the yeast to ferment. Yeah, I mean, in, in your your comment about hot break, you know, mashing at different temperatures is going to lead to different levels of proteins at the end. You know, we're getting different enzymes going on. I mean, it it's more. You know, we said it's a complicated process, and it is. We focus on the alpha amylase and beta amylase, but there's tons of different enzymatic reactions going on at the mash temperatures. We're turning things on and off, and so of course, it's going to lead to downstream behaviors. Totally, totally. So, so after that, after for, uh, the fermentation started, we leave them there. I tend to do about three week, uh, two weeks of uh, total fermentation, but after a few days, the beer slows down. So I raise the chamber up to 70 Fahrenheit or 21 Celsius, and let them go. And then at 14, uh, total 14 days, I rack these to two uh, uh, corny kegs. And of course, we want to get all the data. So we take the finishing gravities. The lower mash temp beer finished at uh, 1.012, while the high mash temp beer, 1.025. So Marshall, we did it. We proved, <laughs> we again proved the mash temp affects the finishing gravity of the beer, leaving us with two beers, one beer at uh, a finishing ABV of 5.4% versus the high mash temp at 3.9%. That is science in action, absolutely mm. observable, absolutely consistent, happens every single time. Every brewer out there has experienced this very objective and easily to uh, e easily observable impact of mash temperature. Boom, yes. we've done it again. Now we did it again. The question is: after packaging these beers, which you racked them into sanitized kegs, you you carbonated them in the keezer and yep. left them alone for a couple of weeks. Were you now? We have to the little preface here we this was during COVID-19 quarantine so you were unable to uh, get you know our, our 20 blind participants to do the triangle test uh, but what we are doing during COVID is we we're do, serving ourselves triangle tests in as blind a way or as, as unbiased a way as possible uh, it involves taking four cups marking the bottom of two of them putting the same beer in the two marked cups and then the other beer in the other ones and then randomly selecting three of those to do the mm -hmm. triangle test the nice thing about it is it randomizes which beer is the odd beer out? You know, which one is the unique sample so that we have that going for us. But the yep. question now, we, we there's a very real difference that we are able to measure. Can you taste that difference based on these uh, different mash temperatures? Yeah. So uh, in the tri the test we do, the triangle test, we set a number of trials and then you need an expect expected number to come back that you paired correctly uh, to be correct. So for this, we had 10 trials. And you would need at least seven to come back to have a significant result. And in this case, it came back with a astounding nine out of 10. So I was <laughs> correct, nine out of 10 times. Um, again, 
breeding about mash temperature, we're saying, you know, at least the experiments have been run. We're not seeing significance, but hey, at least for me, again, in this specific case, for my palate, I was right nine out of 10 times. I could tell these beers apart. Um, and it was quite interesting and maybe not what we expected. So I, uh, you know, we break it down aroma and flavor. So similar smelling aromas, but definitely there's a flavor difference. And what I got was that the higher mash temp beer kind of was just less complex and it had a little bit of a uh, acrid ashy note while the lower mash temp beer had a deeper c- flavor uh more you know, just more complexity in the roast character and the chocolate um and it just lingered on my palate a little bit more which you know since we've been talking at the beginning of the podcast i would say we flipped the flip the script yeah. on mash temperature <laughs> exactly and then, and that, rather than uh, it get our expected results so very interesting yeah that is that is to, the way that you described it again you're a single data point you are one yep. person who has a subjective idea you were biased all of that stuff but your description of those two beers is what i would have expected uh you, what the way you perceived the low mash temp beer is how i would have expected you to perceive the high mash temp beer as exactly. having a deeper roast and graham cracker flavor uh that flavor lingering on your palate longer is something uh, again i associate with sweetness and having more dextrins in the in, in the beer um which one did you like better i i really honestly low temp uh ma- low mash temp was my favorite it just came off better it you know maybe that's because we're used to these beers at moderate ma- mash mash at moderate mash temperatures that i enjoyed it more but yeah. it just for me it hit all the notes of english porter it was delicious yeah yeah now now you didn't hate the high mash temp version no 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 yeah. and i would absolutely you know if you had served me if you you know if, in two you know identical times if you just serve me one or the other i would have said oh yeah they're both english porter right if you ask me which one I'm going to order more of, it's going to be the lower mash temp. So. Yeah, that's all. That's, I just, I, I mean, so we, I feel like it behooves us to discuss potential explanations for these results because they do, because they do contradict past results and that's okay. Um, it, it, there's absolutely, it could just be that these beers were different. So if we go down that path and these beers were different, some of the things that come to my mind are that, again, that we finally hit a point, that delta, the difference in mash temperatures between these two beers was finally enough to where the 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 ultimate difference in dextrin level between these beers mm-hmm. came through or maybe it was that you were tasting the alcohol difference whatever it was yeah. it, it it seems plausible at least that that finally they they were so disparate in mash temperature that finally we hit it right okay mm-hmm. the other ones were a little bit closer the range wasn't as far this one does it and if that's the case then it says to me boy we've got a lot of wiggle room you know <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i mean oh you know almost 10 degrees celsius uh in difference in mash temperature i you know i i ascribe if you know we have data so we've confirmed we did it we ran a test we have a hypothesis you know we came back with our answer we look for these reasons and i think what what i i, I, have, I have two ideas one and i think this is the more dominant case is the alcohol we have a full you know, more than a full percent uh, difference, you know, 3.9 versus 5.4. Yeah. So alcohol, you know, how it perceives on your on your palate, how it allows the beer to express its flavors on your palate through the olfactory sense and, and, on, and on your tongue. I mean, those are huge things. Yeah. So I think alcohol is a big, big factor here. I think the second thing, and this is, I've yet to come to a strong, uh, you know, chemical conclusion or find a paper that quantifies this, but you know, the addition of the Unlike the other experiments, we you know the additions of specialty malts and how they mash and how they interact with the alpha amylase and beta amylase. Yeah, that's not as well understood. Right. right. So I th- I also think that those how they break down in the mash were affected by the mash temperature, and that's another factor in my perception. Yeah, it's definitely something I want to look more into because this is a was super fascinating uh, experiment and results. So. Yeah, I, I mean, I 100% expected these beers to taste the same to you. And the fact that you came back 9 out of 10, I mean, that that's telling, if you ask me. And, and it was, and, and I do try, even though you know, it is COVID, we, we don't want to have, we don't want to have these group events. But, you know, my girlfriend's here. She tried it. I mean, came, you're coming to the same conclusion. Uh, these beers taste different, uh, blind. And and yeah, in, in, I think in general, we like the lower mash temp one, but that's not to say the high mash temp one was uh, just terrible. You know, just two different beers. Absolutely. Well, we got a bunch of reader comments on this one, uh, and I'm gonna, I wanted to address a few of them. Uh, really good comments. Uh, one of the things that I really appreciate about our readers is they're very thoughtful. Um, <laughs> so the first one comes from Aaron. He says, I love this topic. Uh, and I can tell by the length of his comment here. <laughs> he says, I've also found that I get a very full flavor from low mash temp beers. Huh, that's interesting. I haven't done a 
side by side, but have done a ton of beers with high mash temps all the way up to 170 degrees Fahrenheit. That is very warm. That's, that's 77 so C. That's when you mash out. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you right now you would think that all of those enzymes, both alpha and beta amylase, would be would denatured, but he yeah, got yeah. away with it. Aaron got away with it. He says, "I really like the lower ABV in some beers. I can make mm. a very nice stout that's under four percent that tastes way better than one mashed low with less malt. I think mm. in this case, maybe the alcohol does have some impact on flavor. Maybe try adding some Everclear or vodka to the low ABV one to see if uh, it seems sweeter or fuller. Another comparison that would be interesting is raise the OG on the high temp beer, high mash temp beer, so that the final ABV between the two is very close. I bet the high mash beer would be fuller tasting. Very interesting ideas there. Yeah. These are great. I mean, I did I did play with the alcohol one a little bit. I didn't do a full blind triangle again. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it definitely changed the sweetness and the perception of sweetness in the beer. Uh, I mean, yeah, these, these these are things we are going to use to go forward because you're know, looking at these experiments, tweaking them a little bit, seeing what results we get. I mean, that's the name of the game for for us. So, I mean, the, it, it was uh, these recommendations are great. It's just it's it's exactly. And I'm actually really interested now that he said the higher mash temp, lower alcohol. You know, low alcohol or no alcohol beers are becoming much more popular now, and the technology to make them uh, high quality and taste like beer is is getting better day after day. Yeah. So it'd be really cool to try that, you know, high mash temp beer to get that lower alcohol, but maybe still have a very high OG. Yeah. Uh, so you're getting that richness in the, in the, in the flavors. Cause you used a richer base, uh, base of grains. Yeah. It's great. I, I absolutely uh, use mash temp now as a, fully as an ABV adjuster. I mean, yeah. that's really yeah. what I think about. Um, the fact that this was uh, significant for you that you tasted this different does it does make me think you know a, a little more deeply about this topic now because sure, I kind of sure. convinced myself uh, it doesn't have a perceptible impact. So the one thing I will also say about you know finish, uh, original gravity is I'm very curious when we go to higher OGs, you know, trying to get the same FG, you know, playing that game where you're having higher gravity beers and then what they do in the end. I think we're going to see that the delta get even wider in my sense is that we're, we're playing at kind of the four or five, six percent ABV range. That actually is more of a limit on my equipment than uh, what the desires of the beers I want to make. Yeah. Uh, but I think the Delta will only get bigger as we make bigger beers, but that is uh future work to be done. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Uh, Josh says, I have had a similar experience when doing the same thing. When I did the higher mash, I was trying to achieve better head foam formation and retention. Did you notice anything in regards to this, especially after they had proper time to condition? So in my case, I was not seeing very many differences here. You know, I think that we talked about the boil and those kind of can look different, but in the end, the beers after conditioning look the same. So I mean, I, I ascribe, you know, head retention to other factors, uh, yeah. you know, I, I think it's your baseball, it's the yeast strain you use and, and everything. So well, I didn't see anything. I don't think it's uh, impossible to see something change. So, I mean, more work needs to be done in that case. Well, it, it, I've done a few mass temperature experiments as well. And I've, and I, I don't believe uh, foam retention or formation was affected whatsoever uh, by mm. mass temperature. I, again, I'm like you, I, I tend to view like protein content and maybe even glycerol uh, production yeah. from the yeast as being more uh, influential on, on foam as well as pour quality. <laughs> However, you're yeah, pouring. Yeah. You know? I, I think if you read if you read the documentation, if you want, we can go do a whole other thing on on, on foam. Uh, but you know, if you read the papers and stuff, you, you're ended up mostly with foam negative things. Yeah, it's you have to find you have to kind of work a little harder to find find to find foam positive uh, elements in brewing. So yeah, yeah. All right, Jerry Jackson says, I guess the base question then is how do you promote body in beer? I high mashed around 160 degrees Fahrenheit some base malt and added it to a cider recipe to try to make mm -hmm. the cider less dry. The effect was pretty subtle, if there at all. Yeah, this is the holy grail here. Uh, you know, we talk about body and perception in beer, but how you get those answers, um, I still have yet to have a clear cut way of doing it. I think the first place to look is a is the ingredients and we talked a lot about mashing and mash temp but the base malt i mean base malt has come so far in you know the thousands of years of barley malting and it really matters i think if you talk and especially like the pro brewers where you get your base malt from so yeah. you have many different producers they're all processing it differently you know i've heard you know vinnie trillerzo was on one of our facebook uh, live uh, live live q and a's and he mentioned uh, certain best malts products have higher he thinks have higher mouthfeel 
And so I think that's the first place to look. The second place I'd be looking is yeast choice. Um, if you're making an American style beer, you definitely have many options in your yeast choice. So maybe trying the, trying to switch up the yeast strain um, to, to see if it gives different uh, flavor performance and, and mouthfeel performance. Yeah, yeah. Um, they, they they all produce different amounts of propene glycol, which is definitely going to contribute to mouthfeel. So I mean, there's a few different roads here. I'm going to be the I'll say it. I really am not looking at mash temperature to for this specific variable. I have a roundabout response to this, um, where I think mash temperature can contribute on some very very uh, I guess like tertiary level. Sure. The when I think of beers that have you know, moderate body, more body to them. I tend my, as the ABV goes up, I tend to associate more body, more body. And mm. where that comes from is the use of more malt. Uh, it's, mm. that's a one, like a, that, that's a, that's a straight positive correlation. The more malt that you use in a beer, regardless of your mash temperature, the more body that beer is going to have. So mm-hmm. if you're trying to get a beer that has a lot of body, and you tell yourself that means I need to use more malt, then a higher mash temperature might be associated with more body because you're using more malt, but you don't want as much ABV in the beer. Sure. So sure, that's sure. my kind of roundabout way of wondering if perhaps this idea that sweeter beers, uh, uh, lower ABV beers, quote unquote, because of the mash temperature is associated with high, you know, hot, warmer mash temps um, because you effectively can get more body. You can get more yeah. of that, that smooth multi mouthfeel if you sure. use more malt and and then uh, again higher mash temperatures will be will result in, in lower ABV when you're using more malt again roundabout way of looking at it I'm not certain that's where it came from but that's kind of how I view it these days so Michael K our final comment says uh, because you noted an ashy character to the high temp or high mash temp beer uh, I'm wondering what would change if you added the heavily roasted grains post mash Per Gordon Strong's advice, thus exposing them to the high temperatures for a shorter period of time, you'd still have the differences in enzymatic activity, but perhaps without the difference of a super ashy beer. Now, this is a con- a, a method that I think people refer to as capping the mash. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And it's when you toss your roasted malts in at the end of the mash or even steep them during the boil type of thing. Uh, we've done an experiment or two on that. We're not going to get too deep into it here, obviously. Uh, but just to say that there, there's good evidence and I talked to Gordon about this extensively when we were in New Zealand together. There's, there's, uh, he actually is the one who, who proposed this idea to me. Uh, and, and I believe there's some evidence behind it to show that when you're capping the mash doing a fly sparge, it's different than if you're capping the mash doing something like brew in a bag or batch sparge. Hmm. Um, and so he, because that, that experiment did come back non-significant. We'll focus on it in another episode. But he proposed that the reason we didn't see a difference or perceive a difference in those beers was because I didn't brew using a fly sparge method. So just just to get that out there. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, I think it's definitely something to look at. I mean, these 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 ne- getting these negative characters from these beers is something we obviously want to avoid. They're negative, uh, but you know, I've also not experienced the same kind of uh, necessarily off flavors so much with the modern grains. So, I mean, I think it's definitely worth trying. I would, you know, do the same thing. We're kind of talked about, you know, combining different experiments and seeing what their impacts are. And yeah, sure. We'll, we'll try a fly sparge uh, with the grains later and see what happens. In my estimation, my thinking is that it's still going to be there because it's a base unit of the grain. It's, it's a, it's a flavor characteristic, uh, the ashy more, or kind of more, you know, smoky notes. Um, and, you know, honestly, a little bit, kind of goes well in, a, in an English porter. Yeah, so yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm here for it. So too much, obviously too would not be great, but I, I think it's also part of the beer's character. Yeah. And there's, you know, there was talk about uh, the impact that pH has on extracting certain sure. characteristics from roasted grains, all that stuff again for another episode, but I do think it's an interesting idea, Michael. So appreciate you leaving that uh, comment on the article. All right, Andy, that brings us to the end of yet another episode. I think we covered uh, mash temperature as it relates to English porter fairly well. Anything else before we wrap up? I think that's it. So I think, you know, to, the what what is this told us? We came in with a bunch of expectations. They were completely shattered. No, they weren't completely <laughs> shattered. Again, I yeah. think I, I I think what uh this just to take away to take home message here is if you're playing around at home with these with these uh with these recipes and this stuff, looking at the extremes of your mash as one variable and to see your final beer is a great thing to try. And if you're willing to experiment a little bit, I think you'll reap huge rewards. Yep. Amen to that. All right. Don't forget, you can read more about the experiment we discussed by clicking the link to the article on brewlosophy.com in the description of this episode. 
The Brewlosophy Podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors as well as all of our rad listeners. We seriously could not do this without you. Cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show. It makes a huge difference. If you haven't yet, please consider doing so. Head over to brewlosophy.com slash support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast. If you want a reward for your support, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Brewlosophy Podcast. Until then, think beer. Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it suits my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yes, yeah, home bro.